Oh, now I have to behave. <clears throat> and Fabry disease. In the lab, we have several projects which all come together and they're under the umbrella of inflammation and fibro fi fibrin formation. Um, even Fabry disease has some inflammatory stuff going on um, after lensectomy is the one I'm gonna talk about today. Mm -hmm. So I go in the clinic, I see patients, and then I go back to the lab and I look at some of the basic science behind what I see in the clinic. And sometimes some of the things I see in the lab go back to the patients as well. And now this doesn't wanna work. Um, and goes back to patients as well. So I'm always thinking on both sides of the fence and hopefully creating things and finding new information that can help patients down the road in the future. And that's my Fabry disease rat. Um, so I'll sp speak about cataract and cataract surgery today. It's the most common procedure in the United States. It affects all ages. And some are at a higher risk of complications, particularly children and patients with uveitis to the point where it changes our surgical plan and management. Um, and this is something that really got to me when I was a fellow where I had these little babies and they had cataracts and we had to operate right away. Um, but then it was really just really complicated afterwards. And that's why people didn't want to do it. So the key here is children are not just small adults. It's not just, actually their eyes are almost the same size as an adult at birth. It grows a little bit in that first year, but pretty much the same, but they behave differently. One big thing that's different about children is amblyopia. So grandma, grandpa has a pretty gnarly cataract. They don't need it out ASAP because they aren't gonna lose their vision and have physiologic and anatomic changes that could be permanent. Children, yes. So that's why when a child is born and they have a dense cataract in one eye, we wanna do it before six weeks or both eyes, we wanna do it before two to three months to prevent nystagmus because the longer you let that vision be low in that eye, the more solidified that poor vision is gonna be. And then you have to, um, you have to deal with the amblyopia. So that's half of the challenge, probably more than half. Um, and that's because children have a critical period of visual development. If you don't correct the problem and rehabilitate the vision by about eight years old, you're never gonna get it back. And that's something that parents don't understand in the post-op period. And the younger the age, the faster it changes. So you know, if you have a two-year-old with a globe trauma, and one eye has reduced vision, you're actually racing to rehabilitate that vision if they have a cataract or something, because the longer that sits there, the faster those changes are gonna happen. So same with pediatric intraocular surgery, cataract is pretty common um, for intraocular. And if you don't treat it, they get amblyopia and you're fighting against that. The earlier you remove it, the better off you are. The problem is you're trading time in the physiologic and anatomic changes for amblyopia with that exaggerated post-operative response. So that's why we try to wait till six weeks to operate on a child, even with the unilateral cataract, because if you do it earlier, you could have more complications. And in fact, we don't, I don't know why this keeps going randomly, but in fact, we don't um, even put in a lens in the eye at MCW. We don't even think about it before the age of one. And between the age of one and two, we think hard about it depending on the compliance of the family. So it would be nice to have an intraocular lens in the eye, but we're left with two options with these newborn cataracts. One, we take the lens out and we leave them aphakic and give them a contact lens for unilateral. At this point, we've been giving glasses for bilateral more often. Um, partly because it's difficult with the lens fitting and lens loss, there's a risk of infection. It could be completely impractical in rural areas of the world or certain situations where they can't come back and forth very easily. Um, and if you don't use that contact lens or some sort of refractive correction, they get amblyopia. So you're trading off one for the other. The other option is to put in an IOL, which we don't do under the age of one because they could get severe inflammation. They could literally have a fibrin cocoon around the lens the membrane can form and change the location of the pupil where it's not in the center at all and give them correctopia. And one thing we learned during COVID is that the pandemic really highlighted the need to address this and be able to put IOLs in babies. I swear to God, I don't know why this is happening. <laughs> Maybe it's from the lights. 
Um, oh, okay. Well, I'll just keep doing it. Um, but it, it highlighted that we do need to work towards getting IOLs in younger ages because the cell soft lenses for the AFAKES were not manufactured for quite some time. Um, and we had a lot of trouble getting contact lenses for babies. Even now, it's still difficult to get them. So we had to go to RGPs. And that's a little harder to teach parents to use. So lots of issues. And the pandemic has even highlighted even more that we need to get this taken care of. So post-operative issues that we see are that mem membrane formation. This is actually a picture from a 10-year-old child. So it's not just babies. Um, the synechia and pupil displacement can be highly relevant. Um, we have several that we try to re-op and then they just scar again and all sorts of issues. And intraocular pressure could go up. Um, and we watched that for their entire lifetime. In the infant apachia treatment study, where they looked at kids who had an IOL put in versus no IOL, they found the IOL group under six months old had a five times higher rate of needing follow-up surgery, and that's just not a good thing. So that's why we lean towards not putting in an IOL under a year of age, but it would be nice to not need to do that. So the rationale for our lab is if intraocular surgery is so high risk due to this inflammation and fibrosis, making us delay surgery, sometimes changing the surgical management, not putting in an IOL, um, maybe we could find a way to not have that happen. And in order to do that, you have to understand why it's different. It doesn't make sense that a newborn baby with no immune system has an overactive immune system in the eye. It just doesn't logically make sense. Um, so we really wanted to understand the scientific reason for these differences and see if we could target new therapies to prevent or treat these complications. And this is highly applicable to children and patients with uveitis, which is what this picture is from. So the nice part about IOLs in kids would be constant refractive correction, um, reduced risk of corneal infection, which actually happens quite frequently. Even with the infant aphakia treatment study, that was an ideal situation where they had access to lenses all the time, lots of teaching. That's not the real world. The family is highly burdened and hopefully in the end, it could improve their vision. So we looked for a good animal model to look at the post-operative response and we chose New Zealand white rabbits. They're nice to handle and they're often used in industry to evaluate new intraocular lenses. So they already have that mechanism to look at how things do after implanting an IOL. And the anterior chamber is similar to humans. So we use the same instruments. We use the same uh, materials actually. Um, everything's all the same. We use the FACO machine, um, even the same IOLs. They have a seriously exaggerated post-operative response. So our thought was if we could get a rabbit to have a good post-op outcome, children should be almost a, uh, almost a slam dunk. Um, and it's a very controlled environment. You send a child home with whatever you're doing, you know, you don't know what's being done. Rabbits, animal models are great because it's a controlled environment. We don't give post-op steroids and we look at their post-op response and it creates a lot of scientific rigor, which makes it easier to translate to people down the road. So the way we did this was we had the hypothesis that some proteins go up after surgery and there are probably some that go down or become undetectable after surgery. And we did this by sampling the aqueous humor before and after lensectomy and looking at clinical exams. So just keep in mind that the aqueous, the anterior chamber pretty much holds 200 microliters on a good day, if you could get that much. So it limits what we could do. Uh, so this is actually a video of our rabbit surgery. Um, so we do a paracentesis before to get the fluid. And then we do use an MVR to make the incision. Oops, why is it doing this? Oh no. So we just make a small incision because we we expand it later. So we put a viscoelastic and then we open up the anterior capsule with the cystitome needle and micro forceps. And then I actually use Simcoe irrigation and aspiration um, to remove the lens because it's so soft and easy in little baby rabbits. This is actually my old grad student. We pre-placed the suture because it could get um, 
there's a lot of posterior pressure. We put in the IOL. And then we take out the viscoelastic and close the wound um, and bury it. And if we put in medications, we put it in once the suture is buried and everything's stable. And then we do slit lamp exams post-operatively. So that's a nice, I had to borrow this from the web, but that's a nice example of the kind of cell and flare we could see in our bunnies, but these are bunny eyes. Um, this is a normal eye without surgery. And this is one of our rabbits post-op and you see that huge chunk of stuff. We used to call it a, a clot because we weren't sure what it was made of. Um, so that's pretty, that's pretty dramatic. And so we could literally look with the slit beam and do the, do the exams just like you do in clinic. Same slit lamp. Um, so we just first wanted to make sure it was an appropriate model. So we looked at older rabbits and younger rabbits. And the older rabbits were much less responsive post-op than the young rabbits. So here on the left is a young rabbit with a huge chunk in the anterior chamber. And on the right is an older rabbit with the same surgery. Um, we did it with FACO and it looked pretty good comparatively. So it's a good model. Um, first, our first question was, what do the different surgical stages do to the proteins in the anterior chamber? So we actually broke it down step by step. We did just paracentesis, then just the incision, then what happens when you just take the lens out and leave them a fake it, and then what happens when you take the lens out and put in an IOL? And we wanted to know what the protein changes were before and after. So clinically, just a paracentesis, really no difference. It's a nice clear lens. Incision with suture, also nice clear lens, dilates well. After a lensectomy without an IOL in the, in the juvenile rabbits, there's some fibrin in the anterior chamber, but not nearly as much as when you put in an IOL. And it's really, really reactive across the board. We see this so often that our number of rabbits to achieve statistical significance is only six. So it's pretty dramatic. So your question is the fibrin on the lens, is it on the posterior capsule? Yeah, it's where the lens was. So it's in that, I, I didn't do a posterior capsulotomy and a vitrectomy in the aphacic because um, I just wanted to know the lens removal. So that's in that, um, post, in that capsule area. So it's not on it, it's just kind of in there. And I, we did remove the lens a lot. Um, there weren't lens particles remaining. So that's just the inflammation. In the lensectomy with the IOL rabbit, you could actually see turbidity of the anterior chamber fluid before we were done because it's so reactive. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so the heifer, so so the age of the rabbits we used were, were six uh, weeks, exactly six weeks, because that's when they could be weaned. Um, and the weight was usually it was under a kilogram. Usually it's around seven hundred grams or so, six hundred. Some of them were smaller. It was variable. So um, and then the heparin in the in the irrigation fluid we didn't use it. Um, and you'll see why in a few slides. <laughs> it actually, I know that they use it in the veterinary world. And that was part of the reason why I wasn't surprised at some of the results we got. Stay tuned, right here. So one thing that we did see, which would, have, would be a surprise to some clinicians, but not to Dr. Werner, <laughs> um, is that there is a large increase in coagulation factors, but there's no blood. It's not like it's... I call it um, avascular coagulation in the anterior chamber. So there's a large increase in coagulation factors and fibrin. Um, so that goes to the heparin in the irrigating fluid because one of our targets is using uh, for preventive therapy is using low molecular weight heparin. So, but we didn't use heparin itself. We used a different one. Um, the other thing we saw was complement components also increased dramatically especially in the lensectomy with IOL and lensectomy groups. So we knew there was inflammatory components, that there's a blood coagulation cascade activation. And then another thing we saw was some immunosuppressive proteins really dropped in these young rabbits, um, even just with paracentesis. 
So that told us that perhaps the young rabbits or the young children also, we still have to do some of those studies. Perhaps the reason they're so overactive isn't because their immune response is hyperactive. It's more that they haven't developed inhibition or immune privilege. So maybe that explains why an immature immune system um, results in these overactions. It's like a double negative. So they haven't developed immune privilege is our guess, but we're still working on that. So we actually mapped out with the coagulation cascade all the things that increased. And so everything in red is increased postoperatively. And that gave us an idea of where we could target our therapies. Also in the inflammatory cascade side, we saw that the classical lectin pathway was pretty um, activated in using the proteomics. Um, so, and some of them talk to each other, which makes sense with COVID too, where you have a high inflammatory response and you also have a lot of coagulopathies um, going on in these patients. So once COVID hit, I just said, oh, they have to be anticoagulated too. And look at what we do now. Um, so the question for us was, now we know all these things increase, but where is it coming from? Is it from the structures in the eye or is it from the blood? And we did that with RNA sequencing. And I won't go into too much detail because um, this is a clinical talk, but we looked at the RNA sequencing changes in um, the iris and ciliary body after surgical intervention. And it turned out that all these pathways increased as well. So perhaps it comes from the iris and ciliary body, but we also looked at the cornea and these um, RNA transcripts also increased. So that tells us that the eye is a very dynamic system and that perhaps a lot of this development of the immune postoperative immune and scarring response may come from the eye itself. And maybe this, um, some of the coagulation activation may also be from within the eye. So in conclusion, um, with our surgical step by approach, the fibrin formation goes up at each surgical step clinically, but really after lens removal and especially with increased implantation of the IOL in the juvenile rabbits. Um, the proteins detected, we have some that increase, but also some interesting ones that decreased following the surgical intervention at all steps. And we did this with mass spectrometry, which was nice because it's a small volume. We tried ELISA and it was just we would have had to use so many rabbits, it wouldn't have been a good way to do it. Um, and that the ocular structures likely contribute to these changes. Chris, yes? Chris, Hi, I can't see anything because it's all right. <laughs> some aspects of rabbits, kids are like at rabbits in some ways, not all. <laughs> Do you use heparin in the kids? Oh, okay, yeah, yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Yes, they do. <laughs> yeah. 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 Scientists from Utah. So I used a lot of your papers. I was walking around, I was like, I know who that is. <laughs> so, so thanks for your pre work on um, helping us develop this model. And so you'll be happy to hear about the prevention side um, is to, so knowing the coagulation cascade and the and complement cascades are activated, um, we wanted to inject candidate medications at the end of surgery um, and see if we could prevent these responses. Right now, all we use in the real world is steroids, right? Um, Triamcinolone, 
intraocularly if we get really worried, systemic steroids, topical steroids. And that's really not ideal in kids because kids tend to have steroid response glaucoma. So I had a child, actually, the, one of the first pictures is the patient that inspired me. And he had increased an IOP. He came to us for surgery. The attending didn't want to do the surgery. So we did the surgery, sent him back because um, she wanted to handle the post-op. He was on steroids four times a day, which I usually do a lot more than that. Um, and then his pressure started to climb. And so she stopped the steroids because she thought it was steroid response. And then it really went up. And then he ended up with surgery. And then he had um, glaucoma surgery because it was all just stuck down. And then he had a retinal detachment and he had all sorts of complications after that when if we could have just prevented this, the inflammation and scarring post-op, perhaps he would have done a lot better. And maybe there wouldn't be this confusion about whether a steroid response glaucoma or aphasia glaucoma. So he's my inspiration. Um, so now looking at these cascades, instead of heparin, I thought, let's put something in the eye that's gonna stick around post-op um, and stick around for as long as we can. So I chose anoxaparin or Lovenox. Um, it's already used in children, so I love that part of it. Um, and we still use triamcinolone, so I use that as one of our controls or standards of care. And then I actually put them in combination to see if they have a synergistic effect. So this is our untreated, as you have seen multiple times. Again and again, it's just a big chunk in the anterior chamber. Um, this is with anoxaparin, so it acts on the coagulation cascade and prevents that fibrin clots. And we actually did some immunohistochemistry and proved that it was fibrin. So now I call it a fibrin clot because I know it has fibrin in it. Um, so that's really nice. It doesn't have that nice red reflex that we like to see, but it's definitely a huge improvement. Eight milligrams is a huge dose. Um, we didn't see bleeding post-op because we did it when the anterior chamber was stable. So I think by not having those changes in the IOP, we didn't have bleeding events. So that was, and it was pretty consistent. Um, triamcinolone, I used a very low dose intentionally because I wanted to see just with a low dose and then in combination. That white stuff is the triamcinolone painting the inflammatory stuff in the anterior chamber. That's not vitreous like you see in the OR. Um, so that's just fibrin that's being highlighted. So we actually got a little confused because the cell is more in the triamcinolone, but that's because we were seeing triamcinolone. So I'm not gonna present that data. And then when we put them in combination, that's when you see that nice red reflex. So we were pretty excited. So I wish someone would put this in a kid. I'm too chicken to do it. So <laughs> we need more dose, uh, dose response curves and a little more science behind it before we translate it to patients. But this is really exciting. Because if we could prevent things, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. So um, we also looked at some of the inflammatory and coagulation cascade changes post-op with targeted mass spectrometry. And this is just a heat map, so you don't get into the weeds of the details. But if you look at the combination, black is closer to zero, red is increased. Some things don't look any different or better with the combo treatment, but there's a lot more dark. So the complement, some coagulation factors are significantly closer to pre-op compared to untreated or noxaparin alone, or even just triamcinolone alone. So that shows that there are definitely proteomic reasons for the clinical exam we see. And we could actually map it out um, and quantify it with the way we did our mass spectrometry and it kind of correlates with what we see that the combination is closer to the preoperative um, proteomics in the anterior chamber of the eye. So we're pretty hopeful that this may be something to target in the future to help our kids. Now, the question is what happens further down the road and you know, you do well in that first week post up in the rabbits, but what does that mean in a child? Does that prevent it way down the road months, years from now? So there are a lot of questions between the rabbit and, and children. Um, so the other thing we thought about is treatment, because we have a lot of patients who have scarring or uveitis patients with a big fibrin membrane, and we don't know what to do. Um, so we thought, let's target the coagulation cascade again and look at our clot buster tissue plasminogen activator. So we injected it at the peak of that postoperative response um, and examined it 24 hours later, and we used a dose of 25 micrograms. So 
what it does is it 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 targets um, plasminogen to plasmin and increases the degradation products and breaks it up. So this is our classic chunky, chunky anterior chamber of the eyes before. Um, our control is just balanced salt solution. So as you'd expect, it really doesn't do much. Maybe it clears up a little bit, but that's just the natural um, way things happen. Pretty, pretty nasty looking. And then one day after a tissue plasminogen activator injection, there's a nice breakup of that fibrin clot. Didn't always go away, but I'd be pretty happy if I had a patient with a nice cocoon around their lens and lots of problems and it looked like that. So we're also pretty hopeful with that. We did um, look at the cell and cell and flare and in the TPA it looked to go up, but that could be because those fibrin chunks are breaking up into little pieces and that's what we're seeing. So um, we did look at coagulation cascade and complement um, changes as well, because we didn't want something that would make it even worse um, and make it more inflammatory because you're just, it looks good, but who knows, maybe the eye is going to get bad CME or something like that. So um, we did look and it doesn't look nice the way the preventative therapies does where it goes back closer to normal, but it wasn't much worse. So we're still looking at this and seeing if it's a viable, um, a viable target. So it doesn't look like it reduces the inflammatory or coagulation cascade components, but it doesn't increase them significantly. But that might be just because they're kind of high to begin with. So still more work to be done on that, but also promising. So in conclusion, um, anoxaparin is a hopeful um, use for preventing this postoperative complications, especially with um, triamcinolone. It prevents and fibrin formation, and then the triamcinolone kind of works in synergy to decrease some inflammation. TPA is also hopeful to improve the clarity of the visual axis after scarring has already occurred. And one of my um, fellowship mentors has actually used this in de desperation in one of her uveitis patients. Um, and she said it worked pretty well, but the guy was blind already. So she just didn't want him to have complications. So I'm not that bold. Um, future directions are looking at these eyes longer term. Really, these experiments are done in one to two weeks. I wanna look months out and see um, other things, especially the PCO. That's the poster capsule opacification is a totally different field that I do not um, have the time to attack. So we could always talk and see if there's other things that we could, that you could work on based on this research. And all our, all our data is publicly available. So if you wanna look at other proteins, it's all on a public data sharing website. Um, and then our next goal. So we did the rabbits and this is a clinical talk and I haven't talked about a patient really very much. Um, our next goal is what about humans? So rabbits, have, we have a nice story with the rabbits, but who cares if humans aren't the same? Um, you know, it's hard to do human subjects because there's so much variability in the population, genetically, environmentally, um, Pediatric surgery is pretty rare. Overall, we see it a fair amount, but that's just selection bias. And then the pre and post-op regimens are different depending on the surgeon and the compliance. So it's really hard to gather data in just an N of sex in humans. Um, we need a lot more numbers. So this is where um, we're still trying to work out a lot of the methods. Um, and our main question is, are we similar in animals versus humans? And this is where Dr. Huang comes in is um, what about the vitreous? The aqueous is not an isolated system. The vitreous is also very dynamic. And how can that help with PVR and post-operative um, fibrosis in kids? Because in an adult, they get a retinal detachment. You know, there's some standard, if it's MAC off, you could wait a little bit. But in kids, even if they have MAC off, their entire retina is just gonna be one big fibrin folded mess. So. Um, maybe children can, we can take advantage of some things in the posterior chamber as well. So what we're doing now is we have a relatively large sample bank with about 100 aqueous and vitreous samples of all ages, some surgically naive, some not surgically naive. Um, it's hard, we can't get pre and post-op samples because our post-op samples and the rabbits are three days after, that's not ethical in human subjects. So we really have to take advantage of surgically naive and patients who are re-ops for whatever reason. So it's a little statistically more complicated, but we are building the sample bank at this point. 
Um, and we did do some preliminary runs. We really have to alter our method because humans are so variable and very different from each other. So um, one is there's just a pediatric trauma patient here. So it's hard to parse out whether it's a pediatric or the trauma, but their complement was way higher. Um, and, and some of their coagulation proteins were elevated as well, particularly the fibrinogen. So that we're still trying to get more pediatric samples to run together because we need a higher end, but it was just a method run to see if it works. But definitely there are some that some proteins that go down and some that are some that are lower and some that are higher because we don't know if it goes down or up because we don't have a pre-sample. So we're looking to collect a lot more samples for more analysis and also the vitreous as well. So in another interesting patient, we had a panuveitis patient. Um, and looked at it sample versus the pool. So we had to look at controls, which were just adults that were having cataract surgery and nothing else going on. Um, and it looked compared to our controls that the pan UVIS had elevated fibrinogen, which is that coagulation fibrotic cascade. RBP3, which may be an immune suppression protein was decreased, which makes sense in uveitis because they're very immune activated. So maybe that's a immune privilege issue and their immune inflammatory proteins were really high, really high compared to our controls. So we're still looking at this and just trying to get more samples and run them together. Um, so lots of interesting things with our pan uveitis sample. With our pediatric sample, which I pointed out already, the fibrinogen was really high and the immune suppressive protein was low, even though it was just a trauma patient. Um, we, they, she hadn't had surgery. The surgery was for cataracts. So the other thing that was interesting about her or about the sample was that it was a trauma patient. We didn't see a frank tear in the eye in the lens capsule, or even during surgery, we didn't see a tear in the lens capsule, but her, their lens capsule proteins were super high. So that tells me that there's probably a micro tear that created the hydration of the lens and created the cataract. So why does this matter? It's pretty obvious, but we do have patients that have had gene therapy. And in pediatric patients who have had Luxterna, they are known to be at a very high risk of cataract. Um, and we're not sure if it's an inflammatory thing or if it's related to lens protein release. So this would be really helpful in those patients or those subjects where they develop a cataract. If we go do the cataract surgery, perhaps we could parse out if it's purely inflammatory or if maybe there are micro tears in the capsule. So lots of, lots of potential here. Um, so we wanna increase sample size, use our surgically naive in different age groups as the control. We kind of threw them all together and looked at the differences as a whole group. Um, we realized that's not good to do in humans, better in rabbits. Um, and we really need to focus on reoperative samples because that's, that's what we're looking for is why they, why they have post-op issues. So that's requiring collaborative sites. So Dr. Huang is a collaborative site. Um, Duke and, and Iowa might also um, join in as well. And we're expanding our vitreous. So I just wanna say most of this work was not done by me directly. Um, I was very hands-on, but um, Jonathan Young defended his thesis based on most of this work. So I have to give kudos to him um, as well as Joe Bogard, who's now doing his retina fellowship. Um, and the collaborators I have are straight up biochemists um, and other really important people in my world. And this is John's uh, cover of one of the journal articles he published that on the cover of a journal. So this is really pretty. <laughs> I thought he did a great job. Um, and then just in terms of hobbies, I love traveling. So this is my family and the reason why I have so many pets. <laughs> Any questions? Ah, I see one from, did I read it? Okay, so Marissa LaRochelle said, we routinely inject TPA in the AC after UV at a cataract surgery cases <laughs> at the end. 25 micrograms, <laughs> so sounds about right. Um, I would be curious to know if that really prevents the, the post-operative scarring that you see. 
especially if you use IOLs. And I would be curious to see if anoxaparin would help as well. So anoxaparin, why, why do we use anoxaparin for prevention and TPA for treatment? We actually use several different drugs um, for the preventative side because I wasn't sure what would work. So heparin was just two shorts. Um, we did Lovenox because it's really cheap and already approved in kids. And then I used Argatraban and that was a complete disaster. It, the eye was just full of blood. So we abandoned that really early. Um, so we did try several based on the science. And so we kept going with anoxaparin because it has a pretty good safety profile too. You don't, you inject it at home, you know, you don't have to have it infused. And so I don't, I don't think systemically it would be a good idea to use it, but intraocularly it's really isolated. And then TPA, that was pretty much the only clot breaking drug that I knew was available. And we were very careful with our choice of the TPA. We used rabbit um, recombinant TPA because we didn't want an inflammatory response from like recombinant human TPA. So we were very careful in what we chose. Right. Yeah, so noxaparin acts in several sites to inhibit that end production of fibrin and TPA breaks up the fibrin, which is probably why we saw more cell in the TPA. We didn't do it immediately post-op. I didn't even think of that. We just wanted to see if it would work in that huge fibrin chunk. So that's, that's a good thought to use that immediately post-op and see. Uh-huh. It looks pretty good. Yeah. Yeah. The ha the half-life of TPA, I think, is not terribly long, so it's good. I, I do think there is a lot of value to preventing or to not having this um, fibrin scaffold in the beginning. And I think it has long-term uh, benefits. So I think whatever method you use to not allow fibrin to form even microscopically, because we, we don't always see it at the beginning, I think it, it's probably going to have benefits months and years down the road. That's why we need to do longer-term studies. Yeah. Yeah, so good, I mean, good control prior to surgery. Um, we, we do have like two or three patients that have been stuck who are in that ambliogenic range and have, you know, new diagnosed uveitis, can't see anything. And we're just in this horrible cycle of when do we intervene? What do we do? So if we had a little more in our armamentarium to prevent these complications like TPA. Yeah, yeah, I hate aphic in kids. <laughs> It's better than nothing. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I agree. Um, but that's why if we could have a couple more things that are non-steroidal in our armamentarium, um, I think it would be super helpful. So T I'm excited to hear that TPA is being used at the end. And we use our, in the rabbits, we use it the same way, right at the end of surgery, everything's stable. Because if you had the pressure go up and down, you're probably going to get some bleeding. So, um, and then is there any concern with retinal toxicity with Lovenox? I did. So um, that's a great question. And we had the same question in the beginning and we actually did ERGs on the rabbits um, after the Lovenox and the steroid and the control and the ERGs were completely normal. So we didn't see anything, any signs of retinal toxicity, but that more studies would need to be done. Yes. Uh-huh. 
So your question is um, if we saw hyphema post-op TPA or Lovenox, because you saw it in the TPA in that study. Um, we actually didn't. Um, I think TPA is, is a fibrin breaking drug. So it's very possible that it's opening up some of the blood vessels. And some of that has already happened because you're using iris hooks and whatnot. Um, so that's why I say potential for health in uveitis because it's a much more complicated surgery and you're definitely touching the iris and tearing it. Um, we didn't see it with either one, but we were very careful when we did it not to, it, we didn't have as much trauma because they're not uveitic rabbits. So, but I'd be curious to see with Lovenox if you get the same problem. Was the hyphema significant? Did it create problems for you? Yeah. So that's hopeful. Yeah. Yeah, I think we could deal with hyphemas pretty well. Yes. Thanks. Yes. So in children today, what would I suggest to minimize the inflammation um, with or without what, I, what has already been done? I, th I think in general, um, I think surgery is getting better in, in a lot of our instruments are better. I feel like the more you touch the iris, the worse the post-op is. And in children particularly, the darker eyes do worse um, than the lighter eyes. So we actually are parsing out our dark-eyed versus light-eyed subjects for the human samples. Um, so I think the less manipulation, the better. We actually recruited an amazing adult surgeon to do the surgery itself. And then we deal with the post-op because he doesn't touch anything and his post-ops are amazing. Um, but for children, this is not even close to ready for prime time. You have to do things in adults first and then march back. I wouldn't use Lovenox or TPA in any child right now. Um, my chair, old chair, at some point, we had a uveitis child who had a post-op mess. So can you inject TPA? I was like, no way. And it turned out they had an anophthalmitis. So I was glad I didn't because I would have been in a lot of trouble. So I think there have to be those finding studies, a lot more work until you even put it into adults and then march it back to kids. The adults have to prove that it's good enough. It's just pediatric IRVs are really tough. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, it's vague. I'm very vague with the, with the slides. It's not that specific for trying to <laughs> I'm being vague. <laughs> yes. Postoperatively, it was upregulated. Yes. So, because of the, I'm going to go back to the pathway. Can we take advantage of the classical pathway activation for to find something that is non steroidal? Yes. <laughs> I'm very interested in that. The more new drugs come out, the more excited I get. You just have to be careful. We actually targeted um, prothrombin inhibition, and it was a mess also. Um, you know, there's a lot more to a drug than just the drug. There's the vehicle, there's, you know, is a preservative free. So you can't just go willy nilly. I think, you know, that's what animal models are great for because you can kind of shoot a little bit in the dark and hope something sticks. Um, but, but yeah, I, I would be really interested to see some of the new anti-inflammatories. We have to get off of the steroids. It's too vague, especially in children. If they have it systemically, it, it could hurt bone growth. And so there are lots of issues with steroids. Yep. I think there's a lot of crossover with AMD as well. 
I think a lot of stuff in the eye is immune dysregulation. Um, and just to be clear, I know there's, there's a lot of cytokines and chemokines that are really heavily researched, especially in uveitis and, and other inflammatory eye disorders. Um, we did not detect any, but that's most likely because we can't detect it because it's such a low, low um, concentration. So we haven't been able to get at that really well. We do see some changes in the RNA sequencing with the with the chemokines and cytokines, but um, we just can't detect it. And that doesn't mean anything. We even looked at doing human, um, like human protein analysis using those antibodies. And it's just, it's not worth doing that because it's the crossover isn't good enough. So we haven't chased that lately. There are so many things to do. Yes. <laughs> Yeah. So your question is, have we taken advantage of the immune privilege? Am I interpreting that right? Investigating. Yes. So we are really trying to get more in the in the specifics of the cast of the immune privilege question, but that's a really broad thing and it's pretty messy. So it's um, grant funding is a little difficult <laughs> when you when you go for something that's very new and unknown. Um, so we're trying to get some more baseline data before we really go after it. But right now, this it's so fruitful going after the coagulation cascade and the inflammatory cascade that that seems to be the closest immediate um, low-hanging fruit. And that's also something that, that we do kind of on the side. That's where grateful patients come in really important because then I could explore quite a bit. <laughs> Great, thank you. in our interactive discussion. Um, so we'll be talking uh, again uh, at noon to the uh, research um, faculty and personnel in person here. Thank you. Thank you.